The only reason we have money in the first place is to solve the coincidence of wants. You know, we're not going to trade chickens for houses or trade apples or meat. People use Bitcoin as a, a long term strategic tool. People aren't just chasing this one asset class that makes the most money. There's like a more clear and even demand for things because there's not this mispriced cost of capital, which then sends private equity investors and those with the wealth to like aggressively attack one thing. Should you go work in private equity? It's insanely competitive for small businesses they have probably the greatest opportunity because they're lean, they can make fast decisions, and they can capitalize before nation states and larger corporates do. Bitcoin is increasing the hurdle rate. Whenever you're a CEO, you have to be damn good at sales and operations in order to just like aggressively get something off the ground. It also allows you to build something that is worth far more. So equity in a company is often how people build wealth. I would recommend learning some of the most valuable skills for business, and you can go get jobs doing this today, either sales, marketing, or operations. If you believe in yourself and your ability, you're likely going to reinvest in the business because you will outpace Bitcoin. One thing about Bitcoiners is they are disagreeable. So could they be on a board and like work through tough decisions? I would say yes. We have an interesting topic. Uh, you, you just said it right now and it was really interesting for me because we have this notion in Bitcoin that you just buy and you hodl. Um, but in order to buy Bitcoin, you also need, <laughs> you, you need cash flow, you need income, you need something to buy Bitcoin with, right? Uh, so either you accept in your business or in, in your job, um, Bitcoin and you get paid to, for, for Bitcoin, or you acquire something else that you can sell for Bitcoin, like fiat or whatever. So, um, talk to me, like why it makes sense to invest in businesses in your own uh, knowledge in your own business uh, to accelerate and uh, not, not huddle forever but uh, increase your wealth yeah yeah um, so yeah thanks for having me on um, on that topic um, we, we often hear on Twitter is just you know buy Bitcoin and, and huddle right like makes total sense because it goes up quickly um, but there's one thing to consider is the fact that you know the only reason we have money in the first place is to solve the coincidence of once, you know, we're not going to trade chickens for houses or trade apples for meat because the apples will go bad. You know, the chickens will never outlast um, or be worth more, let's say, than the home, unless you literally turn that large acquisition of many chickens into your own farm. So it's like, how do we how do we conduct trade? And that's why we have money. And, you know, we all know Bitcoin is the best form of money. So for there's two types of listeners I would imagine right now that I want to speak to specifically. There's the Bitcoin holder who's been buying and acquiring for a long time and they have a substantial amount and every new amount of Bitcoin they're adding to their stack isn't necessarily moving the needle tremendously. So these are uh, larger holders, people who built a quality amount of wealth. And then there's also the business owner who has the cash flow and they think, I want to sustain my business. You hear Michael Saylor talk about, about this and other folks where you want to have a long-term capital preservation strategy, which can, you know, allow you to do M&A into the future or R&D and expansion or just sustain you during a challenging time. But for the Bitcoin holder specifically, um, as you're building wealth in Bitcoin, it makes sense as you're building the skills in your career, whatever you're doing, sales, marketing operations, or maybe you're just a key role player, advancing those skills and taking some of your stack and starting or acquiring a business. And like, why does this matter? Again, the only reason we have money is to denominate and to make trade and just the buying and selling of things easier so that we don't have to have all these different units of account of just items. But it also allows you to build something that is worth far more. So equity uh, in a company or equity in real estate is often how people build wealth. You want to own something that uh, produces cash flow or creates value for the market. And with businesses, you can earn quite a bit. You know, entrepreneurs are typically the people who make and own the most assets and have the most money. And if you ever do want to exit, like we're seeing now uh, with the rise in popularity of acquisition entrepreneurship, that's how you create some of the most tremendous wealth in the world. So, um, and for those not familiar with acquisition entrepreneurship, it's something that's been just very popularized through like MBA schools like Stanford over the last 30 years. Uh, those with an MBA that understand finance, they'll go buy and acquire a business for, you know, maybe like a three, four X multiple, grow it, um, 
roll up other uh, maybe competitors locally or in the arena and then go and maybe sell it for, let's say, like an 8 to 10x multiple, all while making more than the average human. So you make a lot more while you're working and then you have a big exit. So if you do have a Bitcoin stack, my uh, compelling message is, you know, take some, start or acquire a business and work towards providing value in your local marketplace. And the one kind of final thing I'll, I'll say to kind of close the loop on this is, There's a lot of, I can sense like frustration among people about what's happening politically or within maybe corporations and the lower quality of products or standards. Um, You know, there's a lot of uh, folks who do not like, uh, you know, the way like customer experiences are going as like private equity and corporations just roll up and buy everything. And there's a tremendous opportunity for individuals with a, a passion and heart to provide incredible customer service and to offer incredible high quality goods there's an opportunity for you. So hopefully we can dive into that, but I'll pause there because I, I did share quite a bit. Yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, different uh, routes we can go through, but I, I, like, I like to stick with the basics first. Um, why is private equity such a great wealth builder? Yeah, private equity is a great wealth builder. I mean, one thing in particular is you're raising capital and you're able to go and do larger deals. So one instance um, is say you self fund a deal, you just use your own money and go purchase a deal. You're often buying something smaller that doesn't necessarily maybe have all the, the systems or processes in place. If you typically raise money via private equity, you can buy a larger deal. You can bring on other investors. You can bring on their expertise. You can leverage advisors. Uh, and I think the the big thing that you'll just hear for those maybe new to this online is whether you buy a deal that's $1,000 or $10,000, a million or 10 million, the process and things are typically the same. The only thing you're seeing is a difference in zeros. And when you buy something smaller, uh, it might take a lot more work. So in real estate, if you buy like one house um, and someone doesn't rent it, 0% cash flow. where if you buy an apartment complex to continue on the real estate example, and maybe you have 100 doors, you could lose 10% of the the renters, but you still have 90% filled. So you're not just going to zero immediately. So there's economies of scale in private equity. Um, So just for a simple example, we'll we'll go with that. Interesting. Uh, And it's, it's, I think uh, bit, people often con, uh, confuse also Bitcoin with wealth creation. For me, Bitcoin is wealth preservation. So like if you have wealth, if you have financial energy that you just want to keep, that's uh, that's Bitcoin. It's just so happens that Bitcoin right now gets adopted by so many people. And that's why it also grows uh, way faster than it should be. Uh, because once it's at... Uh, um, uh, like it, as once it's matured, uh, it will not grow as quickly as it does now. Um, for for people, there are a lot of different people that are now listening in. Like the age gap is enormous. Like from from fifteen to uh, I heard like eighty. One of, uh, eighty are like the one of the oldest. From people that are maybe now to, in the school and maybe people that already have businesses. Um, people that are f- uh, on the start of uh, finding out like how how can I. Uh, go ahead and make maybe a small business out of that. Um, maybe start with the people that right now don't have a business. They have either a job or something else. Um, how can they uh, leverage Bitcoin? Or do you encourage everyone to, to go the route with private equity and, and, and f- figure at least figure it out? Or is, is, that, is there some personal type that like, no, no, just stick to your job? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it can be very enticing to do private equity. I would say um, four or five, six years ago, whenever I was at my last job, I was in a, a high earning commission job making, you know, 200, 250K a year. And you start listening to Bigger Pockets, which is like the world's biggest real estate podcast. And you learn about becoming a limited partner where you just invest capital with these larger general partners who find the deals and you get passive cash flow. And granted, I'm still getting passive cash flow and it's great. But one thing I learned is it's a better vehicle for people with large amounts of wealth. Like if you're, if you're young, you've got, you know, under, you know, 250, 500 K, I wouldn't necessarily advise you to just go plow it into private equity. Um, But should you go work in private equity? It's insanely competitive. You know, if you have a finance background and you want to go work under a general partner and learn the ropes, sure. But what should the average person do? Should you go pursue private equity? Probably not. What should you do? 
I would recommend learning some of the most valuable skills for business. And you can go get jobs doing this today, either sales, marketing, or operations. Whenever you're a CEO, you have to be damn good at sales and operations in order to just like aggressively get something off the ground. But if you join an established company, um, you really can be great at sales or marketing and thrive and make a ton of money. Sales is one of the best jobs to earn a high commission and learn the ins and outs of the business. And um, for the operations piece, it's at the core of every business, like helping thread things together. You know, you've got the visionaries that just blaze a trail and they do things their own way. That person doesn't necessarily bring like organizational and operational excellence across an organization to people. Like every trailblazer needs someone who can process things and standardize it so that an organization can function. And that's where like you can build one of those three skills and, and truly thrive and, and do well in the business world. And by learning those skills, lastly, if you can begin to really understand and, and just grok some of those and begin mastering them, it gives you the tool set to either acquire a business that maybe lacks one of those skills where you can bring value and improve it, or you can start a business that's in your realm of competency and you can start very lean. One of the best things about you know starting a business nowadays versus 20 years ago is you've got the internet. You can get going very easily with digital assets. You can spin up near cheaper for free and launch your business online or locally like very quickly so do you see any um gaps in the bitcoin industry where like oh the, the, those are interesting avenues that business potential business owners can go through in the bitcoin landscape i mean we have hardware wallet uh providers we have bitcoin exchanges uh we have uh, lightning wallet providers we have already a lot of different businesses especially when you go to the Uh, bigger Bitcoin conferences like Bitcoin Prague or Bitcoin Nashville, you're like, wow, there are a lot of different companies involved and it's a big industry. Do you see anything where like, oh, this, this could be interesting to do in Bitcoin? Or is it more interesting to do something completely outside of Bitcoin and just leverage the private equity to get to more Bitcoin? Yeah, um, I think there's more interesting things outside of Bitcoin. Um, you know, Some of the largest and most well-funded companies are all exchanges. Like, and I mean, do you want to open an exchange? I think is the first question. And you know, hardware wallets, right? Like hardware companies that actually execute and do well uh, are doing great. So like exchanges, like who's done well? You know, Swan has done well, regardless of their layoffs, like their core business functions um, unchained, even though they do do loans, like their business is, is doing well. You have river.com, you got cash app, you've got strike. A lot of these companies are doing well and there's some of the ones that are more funded is because like the most simple thing you could do in Bitcoin, <laughs> simple, relatively, right, is create an exchange because that's what people want Bitcoin for. They want to buy it. And then what do they want to do? Because people don't necessarily use it completely and globally fully for payments. So it's a store value. So after the exchanges, there's wallets now or hardware wallets now. There's a lot of opportunity to make Bitcoin more spendable, like what ZapRite is doing, you know, bring in legacy payment processing and Bitcoin payment processing into one. Um, and there's a lot of other businesses. But I would say broadly for most people where I think most just people in the world right now, your, your skill set probably lies outside of Bitcoin. So I wouldn't tell everyone like you need to come work in Bitcoin and you could do it because you're passionate about it. But as far as like uh upside money wealth building like if we're talking purely like business it's by far going to be doing something outside of bitcoin but leveraging that business vehicle to acquire more bitcoin i'd say and for those who already have uh like the let's switch to the side to who already have a business who already have some something going no matter how big it is um what can they do with bitcoin obviously like accepting as a payment and putting on treasury but is there is is there What, what can they fundam fundamentally do with Bitcoin? Yeah, I think the most simple thing would be to just put excess cash flows into Bitcoin and save in it. Um, and there's definitely a learning curve for that. Some people get it and they just quietly do it. Some need to kind of go through understanding like why, like why is this valuable? Um, the other piece, if you want to step out just a bit further, would be accepting it as payments and building a marketing strategy around accepting it as payments. So one thing that's um, happening in the world right now, we're seeing some business owners do, is they, uh, they deploy a Bitcoin marketing strategy to attract uh, Bitcoiners as customers. So there's a handful of folks who have done this and they've done panels uh, in Austin, Texas, talking about how 
by having a marketing strategy and trying to attract Bitcoiners, you have a lower cost to acquire a customer. There's a higher lifetime value and these people want higher quality products. So I think it's still very early where um, that's not just disseminated and everyone knows that, but we're seeing it to be true in our space. Um, and beyond accepting it as payment and having a marketing strategy, the other thing would be um, creating incentives or rewards over Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. So since a lot of um, younger folks in particular, they uh, do view Bitcoin as money, you know, they, uh, they, they hold it and they want it. If your business can bring on or onboard or incentivize uh, the younger demographic with some type of gamification or a reward mechanism, there's a good chance that you will find success by doing that. And one business in particular that's been doing that for uh, Shopify is Oshi. If you're familiar with Oshi app, where um, whenever you purchase something via a Shopify store, you can immediately reward uh, users with Bitcoin. And what often happens is people come back and purchase more often, uh, lifetime values increased, and um, you can create like a, a referral incentive mechanism. So that would probably be the, the third step. So one, treasury, two, Bitcoin is payment and using it as marketing. And then three would be like gamification or an incentive mechanism. How big is this marketing effect still? I mean, we have big and small examples of that, like even like a country like El Salvador, the marketing effect was good because all of a sudden everyone is talking about El Salvador. Um, but this marketing effect, I guess, will diminish over time as more and more businesses do it. I mean, MicroStrategy had a, a major effect because <laughs> we're the first publicly traded company. Now, uh, many publicly traded companies have done it. Um, are we still early in, in this, this marketing effect or is it uh, slowly already diminishing? Yeah. Yeah. Sailor talked about this a lot at uh, Bitcoin 2024. As far as the nation states, we are extremely early. Um, and, you know, they, they've in El Salvador has ingrained Bitcoin within their, their country and culture. And that obviously has had a tremendous effect for them. Um, even their bonds yesterday, I saw uh, Bukele like share a post on like their bonds are still like number one, which is just phenomenal to see. Now, as far as companies, um, it is still early, but it's far less uncommon. Like it's not common, but it's, it's far less uncommon, right? Because we are seeing a lot of companies buy and acquire it. And they do see a lot of uh, public equity interest of folks investing into the company, like MetaPlanet, Meta uh, similar scientific uh, microstrategy, as you named, and people enjoy playing that volatility. Um, I think it will become normalized in the next three to four years where it's not going to be a big deal. So if your company does acquire a Bitcoin strategy, like four years from now, you're not going to see like a 25% pop in stock because there's going to be such a diverse amount of businesses that there'll probably be a corporate Bitcoin ETF portfolio, you know, and it'll hold like the 50 or 100 companies that hold Bitcoin as a treasury strategy, and then it'll just kind of die off. But as far as individuals and small businesses who are far more lean, um, you know, it, it's not really, I don't think you could just say it's, it's too late because we're still so early on the nation state and the corporate adoption. But four or five years from now, it may not have the same upside. Volatility will be diminished, right? So if you're not uh, with, if you don't have a ton of free cash flows, it may not be perfect for you yet. Maybe do a half a percent or percent. But four or five years from now, you won't have necessarily, potentially, the same upside. You know, it could just rapidly change. But for small businesses, they have probably the greatest opportunity because they're lean, they can make fast decisions, and they can capitalize before nation states and larger corporates do. It's so interesting for me because um, when you mentioned it in the beginning and now I remembered it again, um, when you have Bitcoiners now hodling uh, and they don't want to spend the Bitcoin, what they're es essentially doing is like they don't want to give the Bitcoin out because they know Bitcoin is doing some returns. And so in order to spend Bitcoin, you have to find an opportunity that's bigger than that. So. Bitcoin in a sense, when you think in Bitcoin and not in US dollars or some other uh, currency, it's increasing the, the hurdle rate of that. Like you, you have a bigger hurdle rate of all of the sudden. Um, what, what can that do to the business world overall if, if, if Bitcoin is delivering uh, as, a, as a more safe um, uh, vehicle 
um, better returns uh, and it's a safer way of, of storing your wealth. I mean, US dollars, like everyone knows, <laughs> you get, get out of that and um, put something in something else. But what if we are m more mature and more businesses have their cash in Bitcoin uh, and it gets normalized that uh, businesses and individuals hold Bitcoin? Does this increase the, the hurdle rate of uh, investing in newer stuff? And what does that do to the, to the private equity and the startup world? Yeah. So, so I guess in like a more simple form, you're saying like, uh, why would businesses not hold Bitcoin versus reinvesting in their company? Yeah, I think it's it's just uh, hiring the hurdle rate of investing your money because all of a sudden your money is not losing in value, but it's, it's increasing in value. So the hurdle rate of, of uh, just investing in everything um, uh, is hiring. And I'm wondering if Bitcoin, if at all, has an impact on, on the normal economy of, of the, the company uh, economy and startup world, maybe also uh, when the money is not so free. Yeah. Yeah, that's a... That's a good question and there's like a deep answer. So the the things that come to mind is when when you're a business and you're a private business or let's say you're a 51% shareholder of a public business, you kind of control the outcome. Sailor obviously educated everyone and got their buy-in. He just didn't strong arm the decision. But if you're a private business, you can just go all in. Now, if if you're not that type of company or that type of decision maker, you typically are responsible to shareholders um, and your job is to do like, you know, a few different things. Um, Lynn Alden wrote about this this week in her paper where you're either going to do research and development and improve on current things. You might do merger and acquisitions and roll up another company into yours, you know, blending two cultures together, which is its own challenge to like create uh, a better business, or you're going to return cash back to investors um, and you decapitalize the company. So right now we are seeing a lot of uh, publicly traded companies save in Bitcoin. Um, the other thing uh, about this, though, from just like, let's say you're a small business owner and you're not public. It, it depends on your vision and your capability. If you think to yourself, like, I don't have the capability to organically grow this and drive more value and increase the value of the business, then maybe Bitcoin's for you. Maybe you're like, I make four or 500 K a year, and I'm just going to put the rest into Bitcoin. But there's also when you grow a business and it's, it gets larger and larger, it sells at a higher multiple because it's more sustainable. So we brought up private equity. Um, you know, a lot of companies might sell at like a two, three, four, five X multiple, sometimes higher if they're in high demand. And then if you can acquire one of those, or let's say you have one of those and you say, I'm going to grow it the next five to 10 years, you might be able to sell it for, a 10 X multiple, a 15 X multiple, whatever. So what's your goal? Like, can you, can you save some in Bitcoin and reinvest in the business? Or are you going to just invest purely in the business and grow it and get a massive multiple? Or are you going to, you know, do something else? And I think that's the question. Like if you believe in yourself and your ability, you're likely going to reinvest in the business because you will outpace Bitcoin. And if you study, um, like these acquisition entrepreneurship funds, like the average return for the last 30 years has been 36% a year. So I think there's an opportunity for small business owners to do a blend of aggressive expansion of the small business and the core business while having a Bitcoin strategy. You can still do both, but also over the next like 10 years, let's say like the Kager on Bitcoin, instead of being in that 40 to 60% range, you just see people kind of throw out um, 36% is pretty close to that. And there's some businesses that are a far bigger home run that exceed that. So it really just comes down to doing like a personal analysis. Are you good enough to grow the business or are you not? If you don't believe you are, maybe you do Bitcoin. If you do believe you are, you continue to grow the business and you use Bitcoin as a core tool to grow the core business. And I think that's going to become a popular strategy. Like uh, to kind of wrap up my answer, people use Bitcoin as a, a long term strategic tool to roll up other organizations or to do deeper research and development. Because if you can grow your business and save in Bitcoin at the same time, because you have that much cash flow, which is the dream, you can partake in both of those. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep 
the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way there's something really interesting on my mind right now um when when we have let's let's take the normal people that don't build businesses and don't invest in private equity and don't play uh, this private equity game um and they are investing right now mostly in etfs uh, maybe they have some some other small things but the vast majority, at least in on Austria, what I see, they have either real estate or they have ETFs uh, or they have some some other funds that their bank advisor tells them to. It's a it's a big chunk of our economy that uh, the, the 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 normal people just invest uh, whatever they have in whatever their bank advisor says to them, yeah. um, which kind of pumps up for one the real estate price uh, and for other the, the ETFs and the stock price. Can Bitcoin, uh, when Bitcoin sucks up more and more of the financial energy of gold, of uh, of real estate, of the stock market, uh, because uh, um, companies save in Bitcoin, individuals save in Bitcoin, could that bring those multiples uh, actually down on, on stocks or are those multiples on stocks and private equities something that has always always been there and will always stay there at, a, at some some level? That's a good question. I don't think it will necessarily like when Bitcoin becomes like the money, I don't think multiples will come down and there'll be phases to this. This is such a good question. I think in the short term, multiples will not come down. I think in the long term, multiples will also not come down. But in, in, in between like the short term and the long term, there may be a period where there's like a flight to Bitcoin. It's, it's hard to say, but I think multiples will stay near the same because at the end of the day, like back to the original thing we were talking about at the beginning of this um, chat together is the reason we have money is to facilitate trade and to allow goods and services to flow. So will Bitcoin diminish the demand for goods and services? No. Could it diminish um, real estate and how we value it? Yes. Um, will it uh, change uh, the what people pay for a certain business. I don't think so because let's say there is this hyper Bitcoinization event where like overnight we go from the dollar to Bitcoin. It'd be pretty catastrophic. Like people talk about this all the time. Like the money is not spread out enough among people. But would it change the multiple? Probably not because the demand for the service is still there. Like I don't think Bitcoin is going to go from like a store of value to the money in such a swift time where multiples break. I think what will happen is it'll slowly go from store value to medium of exchange. And during that time, 
prices become more stable. Because one thing, for instance, like over the last like <clears throat> year or two is uh, acquisition entrepreneurs and private equity, they've gone absolutely ape mode for like HVAC and like plumbing and electrician companies because their margins are so high and they might have sold for like a three, four X multiple. Now they're selling for like eight to 12 X multiples. And that has to do with money being broken, right? Like, what do we invest in? Well, HVAC's hot. We have to get them because they're they're the thing to own. Well, the multiple went up. I don't think the multiples are going to come down. But as the money is repaired, I think things will normalize. We'll see less volatility of certain multiples up, right? Because people aren't just chasing this one asset class that makes the most money. I think what happens is there's like a more clear and even um, demand for things because there's not this mispriced cost of capital, which then sends private equity investors and those with the wealth to like aggressively attack one thing. So, you know, I could be wrong. I'm not someone who lives in spreadsheets all day, but I just think from like a, a pragmatic sense, if the, if the money is good, we're not going to see these wild swings and multiples of certain industries compared to others. It'll be purely based on what are the economics of this industry with sound money. A really interesting. Um, where are those multiples coming from? Like, if, if you are an investor, how do you assess uh, uh, those multiples and you, how you're like going ahead, like, oh, let's put that multiple on? Like, I mean, in, we, we have so many different examples of like, oh, let's put a five or like a 10x or a 15x. Then there's like high growth stocks that are maybe also public. They have a, a crazy multiple on them. So, like, how do you look at those multiples? I mean, it has zero to nothing to do with Bitcoin, but I'm very curious uh, how you think about that. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I'm, I'll humbly say, like, I'm not the person who is qualified to, you know, value a business. Like, I'm not um, a finance person by trade. <clears throat> but the one thing I would say, like, valuing things on a multiple that I've, I've learned over the last two to three years as I'm, like, uh, kind of growing in education on this is, the thing that we are seeing and what Saylor is making an example of in the publicly traded markets is all stocks are overvalued. Like we've become so heavily invested into public equities that we we bid them up and the multiples get so high because where do we put our money? That's what I'm that's what I've understood. So, um, you know, where do these multiples come from? Some of it is from a broken cost of capital, from what I understand. And um, as far as like valuing a business, I think the short answer just from like a, a layman's person like myself is you see an industry that is resilient, you know, like when it comes to homes where everyone's equity is like majority of Americans, like wealth is in their home. What's key to a home? Well, there's HVAC and AC, you know, we need that. There's plumbing. If you don't fix that immediately, your house will be destroyed. So there's no sleeping on plumbing. You could live without AC for a week or two, right? But plumbing if water gets everywhere, you're done. And electrical, if you don't fix that, there's a huge fire, right? So like if there were like three businesses that demand like a bigger multiple, those would be the ones. Um, but as far as deriving multiples and all of this, like uh, I'm not really like someone who, you know, lives that day to day to like give a good answer. Uh, fair, fair enough. Uh, it's interesting how, how, how they come together. Like I was before Bitcoin a, a stock investor and I didn't mm. fully understand what I do, but uh, I'm, I'm happy I'm Bitcoin now. But it was a lot of fun, honestly. And uh, if yeah. Bitcoin is more mature, I might might consider going back in some stocks because it was just really fun to, to watch them. Um, how fast do you think this institutional adoption of Bitcoin uh, will go? Like we have 2020 kind of like the start with, with micro strategy in the publicly traded realm. Uh, we had now, uh, I don't know if you saw it, at Bitcoin 24 in Nashville, uh, MicroStrategy and Bitcoin Magazine uh, announced that they partner up to help institutional adoption and, and drive this. Um, there are way more people now involved in this game and it seems like there's like only one direction and there's one company after another company that's coming into the game. It's kind of hard to keep up with uh, everything that's going on. How fast yeah. do you think we are at a pace, uh, at, a, at a rate where we like, oh, it's, yeah, of course, your company, you have uh, excess cash flow, of course, put something in Bitcoin. How, 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 when will this be uh, like kind of the norm? Yeah. So one thing that's funny, um, and this is just an anecdotal thing, like I've worked in um, like digital marketing and sales for small businesses my entire life. And 
it's it's always interesting when you hear like a small business owner come through and it's not all of them but they're like i want my website to look like apple or they bring up this big company and they're trying to be like them and they're not even in that industry people people admire and want to model after the biggest companies in the world even if they will number one never be like them or two more importantly they're not even in the same industry so how fast will adoption be I think the stuff Sailor and like Bitcoin Magazine are doing, you know, if they're partnering to like educate businesses, they'll get a lot of like these smaller like zombie companies or like cash rich companies that just kind of coast by to make the move. But I think as far as when everyone starts doing it is going to be when like two or three more like Fortune 500 companies do it because then other Fortune 500s will do it. And then you start hitting almost like a, a point where like, the average business owner just won't ignore it because their favorite, you know, business influencer or like talking head on CNBC is doing it. <clears throat> but I think we're at least like four to five years out. You know, I think there'll be hundreds of businesses over the next like year or two that do it, but it'll be a while before it's kind of like a landslide. Like this is an obvious treasury asset, but I think for the small mid market, it's very rational and it'll probably happen a lot. We just won't hear about it because a lot of these companies don't make headlines, you know, but it, it's definitely happening. Like I know a handful of business owners personally that have started stacking Bitcoin. So I think it's going to be the stories that we do not hear where it really happens, like just up to the right. But as far as like headlines where it's like normalized and then everyone kind of makes it a standard practice, it'll probably be at least another four years. Up. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think four or five years is, uh, is anyways uh, right. a quick time. Like uh, if, if that's that actually becomes the norm, like five years is like, uh, very quick uh, to begin with. Where do you see yeah. uh, Bitcoin in general? Like, do you see it as as, as uh, becoming the main medium of exchange unit of account? Maybe in like twenty, thirty years. Uh, obviously, not in the next five years, I think. But uh, how how does how does Bitcoin look for you in like twenty, thirty years? Yeah, I mean, um, as far as like Bitcoin functioning as something that can just be spent and used day to day by everyone, um, I do totally see that being possible and it's been debated forever like and we know it probably won't happen on layer one but all of these different layers like the lightning network um, e-cash um, like uh, fediments like all these just different things and innovations that are happening all of that is most definitely going to happen and you know there's 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 other problems to be solved which i'm not an expert on mining but was listening to bob burnett talk about how there's going to be markets where businesses like prepay for block space in the future and there'll be derivatives on mining and all this. And I think a lot of these things need to happen in order probably for Bitcoin to become like the global monetary asset we want, because a lot of these things like layers to payments, you know, like we've got cash, we've got credit, we've got debit, we've got lending, we've got derivatives, we've got options like if all of that stuff wasn't there, I don't know if we'd be able to like potentially globally manage the risk of just like operating with dollars currently. You know, something would have to come down where we would have to have a, a fixed supply potentially. You know, I don't, I don't know, but I would imagine all of these like systems that our world currently thinks in, like in terms of derivatives, options, blah 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 blah. That's going to have to happen for the big financiers to use it and take it serious because that's the worldview they come from. And will they live forever? Will they blow up? That's to be determined by the market. You know, one thing that we've seen is when you add these games to Bitcoin, it creates issues because it is the first sound digital money. But I think it's like this crossing the chasm where until these things that the financial like legacy world knows, until those things are on Bitcoin, they may not view it that way. And whether or not, you know, me and you necessarily like it, a lot of these people that control like, how money functions, they're going to want those things there. So probably not the answer Maxis want to hear, but I, I just try to approach it in like a, a logical kind of pragmatic way where like I see some of those things needing to happen for the world to use it. And it doesn't mean there can't be a grassroots movement where people use it and it's top up, but I imagine those things would need to be here. Ah, it's so so fascinating. Uh, I I try like uh, I don't know if you know, but I, I do a an, an daily interview with Bitcoiners every day, and I'm always mm. curious to hear like how do you imagine Bitcoin in the future? And I've now you met 205th uh, um, podcast actually, and I I try to ca kind of like summarize or like get a direction from all the Bitcoiners different uh, from all the different fields of like 
people that only have 10% of their net worth in Bitcoin are were on my show. People that have 100% in their net worth in, uh, in Bitcoin and only hold Bitcoin are on the show. Uh, and also people like you that uh, have uh, private equity and, and, and invest in, in other things. So like, I, I just try to figure out uh, from, from a, a very broad perspective, where could we go? But it's such an interesting thing. Like uh, I probably mm-hmm. will, will make a summary and maybe, maybe put it in an article or something like that. It's really interesting, all the all the different opinions in, in one together. Um, yeah. When we can, yeah. Uh, when oh. we, yeah, I was just going to say, like, I agree. Like, I know the answer that, like, I shared earlier is, like, not what I would want. Like, I would think that we could spend on Lightning because me and many other people, we use Lightning constantly and it functions fine. Like, I don't have issues with it. And I know um, a lot of businesses are beginning to use it and we see them having success with, with it at Voltage. Like, it creates tremendous value. Like, there's some exchanges that save $300,000 of on-chain fees a month and they're not even the biggest exchanges just by using the Lightning Network. So the amount of value businesses get from it and the amount of value that like people get from it, you know, I think is just um, unfathomable, but it's a, it's again, this uh, it's just a big problem, but yeah, sorry. What was your next question? Uh, there's uh, one uh, last topic that I want to get into with you. Um, uh, do, do you think uh, and why do you think so if so you think so that bitcoiners uh, the people that are right now actually getting bitcoin and and they understand why it's valuable are those great entrepreneurs innovators founders of new companies are those uh, the type of person usually do 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 be great uh, company leaders in in the future do they have uh, when you think about uh, that average <laughs> bitcoiner who gets bitcoin can they also figure out companies um the average bitcoiner that gets bitcoin can they figure out how to run a company i think they have the the curiosity to so but the thing about running a business like versus just being a a knowledge person is like business does require emotional intelligence and twitter doesn't represent everyone in bitcoin and good lord do we know that to be true but a lot of people on twitter are completely emotionally unintelligent they don't have the capability or just vision to like be empathetic and lead people and, and guide a team. Um, but are they capable of it? I would fully say yes, because one thing about Bitcoiners is they are disagreeable. So could they be on a board and like work through tough decisions? I would say yes, you know, let's not insult each other. (laughs) But the other thing is, um, they have the capability and bandwidth to go out and learn things that they don't know. So if you are willing to go learn something and like master a new skill and then like put it into practical application, like with people, I would say totally. But, um, you know, is everyone meant to be a business owner or entrepreneur? No, but are they capable? And dude, does the average Bitcoiner who goes like down the rabbit hole, are they capable of doing it? I would say so, but there's going to be a lot of just, I think, emotional intelligence and kind of going above and beyond in order to do business. Because think of it this way. Once someone understands Bitcoin, it's pretty hard to like go back. But sometimes when you understand business and what it takes and the stress that is required to like overcome in order to create a successful business, most people aren't built for that. They don't want that. They would just love to go make a good income. So I think that's like the differentiator. It's just it's kind of a personal preference too. Yeah, that's uh, that the interesting point. Uh, first of all, I agree one hundred percent with you uh, on on that, and also with Twitter. I just want to say that. I met a lot of bit, Bitcoiners in real life that I first only met on Twitter. Uh, and <laughs> it, it seems like there's this one uh, meme where there's like two dogs barking at each other and there's a fence <laughs> in between. And then you open that uh, and they're like really nice to each other. And uh, yeah. if you go to a Bitcoin conference or a Bitcoin meetup, it's not Twitter. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. T- t- Twitter, I don't know, Twitter maybe... Uh, struck some feelings and emotional things uh, inside of us that are not there when you meet the person actually in real life and uh, it's it's good that it is that way uh, but Twitter is a fun place and <laughs> I, I'm i I'm less and less on, on Twitter and more and more just in real life and spending time on the podcast and spending time in my own uh, reply and comment section but Twitter is still, still a fun place <laughs> I grew up there but I kind of switched to podcasting more and more yeah, that's cool. Yeah, when I was at Bitcoin 2024, it was such a, a positive and optimistic place. And it was really hard to like be on Twitter when you're there because there's like so much going on and you're just meeting so many people that are trying to like do incredible stuff. And 
it was so refreshing. And then when I came home, you know, we're back at work and then you're kind of on Twitter, you know, maybe like an hour a day, like reading the news, staying up to date with what's going on. It's just kind of draining. But yeah, as they say, the meat space, the real world meeting people is good because a lot of folks kind of, you know, they let their guard down and I get it. People on the internet, we are a lot like dogs because we've got like these digital walls in between us and you, the algorithm is just trained to like make people frustrated, especially during election season, you know, all the stuff that that's on there. It just kind of, whether or not we notice it, it just like kind of, it lingers. It's like bubbling, like a, like a pop in like the Disney movie, you know, where the little witch is over it. Like, <laughs> it's just like the internet tries to do that to you, but then you get in person and it's just like, Bitcoiners are incredible. They come from all walks of life. They, there's so many problems that can be solved and they're doing it. So I agree. It was, that was a, such a good event to attend. Meet uh, other Bitcoiners in real life. I think that's a, a big learning that everyone does. I, I, it took me, I think, two and a half years being uh, in Bitcoin and being uh, in the community to actually meet someone in real life. And I, I wish I have done it so much earlier. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a great thing and, and everyone should should uh, see that uh, amazing thing that then can happen from just meeting people uh, in real life and, and doing that. Perfect. Then uh, yeah. we have one last question before we get to the end routine. That is the question that uh, every one of my guests get. Uh, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and all the things that you already talked about on the on the podcast? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what could you learn from me? Um, I guess I don't really spend too much time uh, talking about this because I just do it in my... Uh, job so much, but, um, I've just, I've worked in small business doing digital inbound marketing for 20 years. Like, uh, I started a company as a kid, walked door to door and built a huge book of business. You see grown men doing that nowadays. You know, that's like how a lot of people bootstrap their business. Um, but then also building digital inbound strategies. I've, I've scaled, um, multiple businesses from a marketing side to like 10 to 15 million led uh, sales organizations for small business. Um, I now work in B2B SaaS, <clears throat> you know, and I have for the last three years, but that's not where I've spent my entire career. Um, but small business marketing would be it. And then um, beyond that, um, I'm a dad, <laughs> you know, as of uh, three years ago. So always happy to like, you know, talk more about uh, being a father with uh, folks. So I'd say those are probably like the, the two things. Amazing. Love it. Perfect. And let's come to the end routine. Uh, end routine of the podcast is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And oh, your cool. question from the previous guest uh, is something that comes up actually a lot. Uh, what does freedom mean to you and how do you protect that? What does freedom mean to you and how do you protect that? Um, to me, I think about how um, <clears throat> like God gave us uh, sovereignty. You know, in my mind, simple, we're in the Garden of Eden with them. Uh, we sinned and we lost the perfect world. So what is freedom now? Well, the Lord gave us autonomy and free will. And uh, that's what freedom means to me is like free will to do as you please. It doesn't mean that evil will be allowed because whether it be God or man, someone's going to hold you accountable, whether or not it is their job. So having free will and how do you protect it? I think um the best ways to protect it are what we have in America now, uh, the, the freedom of speech, uh, the freedom of assembly. And, uh, you know, now that we're going into a digital world, having digital protocols that can protect that as those things are under attack, like, you know, in, in yesterday in the UK, they're just like, if you retweet something that misrepresents the government or talks bad about riots or whatever, it's like, we're going to do something to you. It's like, well, being anonymous is pretty important nowadays. You know, I think I know Jordan Peterson and people were debating that a year ago, but it's clear that being anonymous really matters. Having money that can't be censored really matters. So I think it comes down to the, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of speech and the freedom to transact. But, you know, God gave us free will and protecting that and having digital tools that are going to enable us to do that more in this digital world is important. I absolutely agree. Very cool. Thank you so much, Bobby, for, for being on the show. Where can people, when they ask the questions, uh, find you uh, and where can they f find out more about you? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I'm on uh, Twitter on, under I, Bobby Shell. Um, I'm also on uh, LinkedIn uh, on, as Bobby Shell and I have an Instagram. I, <laughs> I started like uh, making some music again, so you can find me on there and see little music stuff on there. But uh, yeah, those are probably the three best places. I'm on Noster as well. Not as active as I should be, but uh, I'm on Noster. And uh, do I need to share my question with the next guest? 
Uh, yes, I usually do this uh, after the interview, just so okay. that uh, you have have time to think about it. Uh, good, good. Uh, I, perfect. Then, uh, thank you so All much right. for for being on, Bobby, and also thank you for everyone watching and listening for being on today with us. Uh, I'll be back as always tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye.